Race two of the day of the new season for Fanatec GT2 European Series, powered by Pirelli, about to get underway here at the Port Ricard circuit outside Le Castellet. Uh, the cars have just been released from the pit lane, making their way round onto the grid before the 10 minute countdown. Things slightly delayed here after a couple of stoppages in earlier sessions earlier on in the day. But the first race that we had uh, this morning for the GT2 European Series was a really good one indeed. It's got uh, a bigger entry than we've had before. Some new drivers, new teams, new cars, and uh, a really good feeling about the uh, 2024 championship. A huge amount of work has gone into GT2 as a category by SRO to try to advance it uh, and go back over the three seasons we've had. Lots of drivers and teams have had a look and done the odd race. Uh, it's sort of persuading everybody to commit. Well, uh, you know what critical mass is like. A good entry stimulates a good entry. And 17 cars this weekend, I think, will grow even further. The race that we had this morning won by... Uh, Leonardo Garini and Carlo, Tam and, uh, Carlo Tamburini. Another win for the Maserati GT2 that debuted here at the back end of last year. This is the winning car from this morning. It is Carlo Tamburini driving to the grid. And as Leonardo Garini has switched from Porsche to Maserati, it's been a, a good decision, seemingly. They led pretty much all the way. Uh, and although they were pushed hard by Reinhard Koffler's KTM, ultimately, the Maserati prevailed, and I think Koffler settled for second, and he was given a penalty anyway for his part in an incident, so it all became a little irrelevant. But the uh, uh, a gap of, in the end, 11 seconds, the winning margin in race one, uh, flattered somewhat by the penalty to the KTM. Uh, the Maserati, you can see there, of Philippe Pret, number two, was a car that was tagged into a spin in the earlier race, and that car... Uh, Still was pretty quick, but time had been lost uh, early on in the uh, course of the race. Philippe Pret still came through for third in the AM category. Right, we have AM and we have Pro-AM. We have mandatory pit stops, uh, and 128 seconds is the uh, pit stop time. But then there is the sort of pit stop penalty, if you like. If you're in the top three uh, from the earlier race, you carry 10 or 7 or 5 seconds extra time in the pits. Uh, so uh, it sort of balances the things out so you don't have runaway winners of every race. Obviously, safety cars in stint one or stint two can have a fair old impact on how those penalties affect you. Uh, but uh, under normal circumstances, it would be a different look to race two than race one. Borja Ricci will start in 61 Mercedes. Mauro Ricci, his father, takes the car over for the second part of the race. Very experienced GT racers, mainly Mercedes, those two. And... The Acodis ASP team, absent from GT World Challenge Europe this weekend, but operating cars in uh, the GT2 European Series. Uh, the whole SRO story really began here back in 1994 when BPR, as it then was, organised its first uh, GT race with the demise of Group C and in international sports car racing. GT racing was uh, looked at and it was the way to go. And Stefan Rattel managed to pull together a a good grid numerically of Porsches and Ferraris and Venturis and other uh, sports cars and look at what we have now 30 years on. Number 10 there, Jakob Matthiasen who uh, was tagged into a spin in this morning's race. He shares with uh, Ronnie Bremer, former champ car uh, single-seater racer in America. It's his team in fact that runs that car, one of the new teams to come into the series this year and uh, Racing Lab Ronnie Bremer's team, the LP Racing Squad, operating Maseratis and other brands this weekend. Philippe Prep then drives number two. His son, Louis Prep, one of the stars of the Bronze Cup in GT World Challenge Europe. So if Lad is here racing, Dad might as well have a go as well. And so uh, and Maserati, fettled by Luca Piri's team for him. The grid not based on race results, but a standalone second qualifying session. And you can see the new uh, leading car and safety cars, the Lamborghini at the front, ready to lead them away. 87 is the car that won Am earlier on in the day. Gilles Vanillet and Jean-Luc Boubalik are the drivers. And it will be Gilles Vanillet who starts this race, pit window between 20 and 30 minutes. 50-minute race uh, we have in total. And looking down on the grid, everybody present and correct. We did have a couple of retirements from the uh, earlier race. Sedi Samini's KTM and also the uh, Dennis Liebel KTM. That one was tagged into a spin and just couldn't restart. Big, big shame. It triggered a lap under the safety car as well, whereas it was a mechanical problem for Sedi Samini. Uh, that is Simon Birch, the Danish driver, 
who's a pretty quick driver, as we saw this morning. Uh, the uh, car raced well after a five-place grid drop in the earlier race, but he made good progress. And Simon Birch, a man to watch, I suspect, here, starting as he is fourth on the grid. Antonio Rankin is down on the grid and has found race one winner, Leonardo Gorini. His car is on pole position, and Leonardo is with Antonio. <laughs> Well, with me in a second, so we've got much, our I'm race sorry. one winner and first pole sitter. How are you feeling? We're feeling good. We're confident. Yeah. Is it? I mean, you've had a very successful day today. Do you think it will carry into the second session? Obviously, the track's cooled down a bit now. Yeah, that, that should be a good thing. And we'll do the best to keep it as it was this morning. <laughs> Brilliant. Best of luck. Thank you. Leonardo Garini then does, does stint two, having done the opening stint in the earlier race. So the way it works out, like GT4, for example, is that... Uh, you start the race, you qualify for all, and you must do a, a separate qualifying session. 89 there, Matto Homola, touring car racer, uh, starts Jan Kravitz's KTM. That was another car that copped a penalty for contact uh, in the earlier race today. Simon Birch's Milwaukee-sponsored car over his shoulder there, but thumbs up from Matto Homola. And so now the grid being cleared, the countdown continues. Uh, the engines will fire at the one-minute board. We'll have the rolling start. Marshall's in the background scampering on the quad bike from one post to another, getting ready to receive the cars and the race officials making sure that uh, the last engineers stay there till the one minute board. That's when the engines fire the largely green topped KTM on the outside of the front row is the one of uh, Martin Koch and to start it, Reinhard Koffler. There it is. That car, certainly in Reinhard Koffler's hands, was quick earlier on, but then a penalty came for its part in a collision with Philippe Pret. Uh, but even with the 10 second penalty applied, it still took second place, didn't lose a position as a consequence. And as it turned out, the third place car got a penalty anyway, uh, even though the margin was great enough for it to preserve it. The penalty to the third place car certainly uh, helped as well. But Reinhardt Koffer is good to go. One minute board shown, engines fire. Mechanics leave the grid and we will be in business. Mandatory pit stops, as I say, driver changes where applicable. You don't have to have a co-driver. Some of the drivers like it because it means they can split the costs. It means that they uh, aren't absolutely cream cracker by the end of two 50 minute races. Uh, others prefer to have the car to themselves and maximize the available track time. They have two long practice sessions. Uh, they have the qualifying and then of course these 50 mini minute mini enduro races. And uh, very shortly race two is gonna be underway then as the field with engines fired, are about to be released. Then the pace car, as it is, will blast away. The race cars on receipt of the green flag will start to catch up. Rolling start, and then we will be in business then. There's the 15-second board in the distance being shown. Green flag is at the back to say that everybody's off the grid. And then it will be Carlo Tamburini who will lead them away in the LP Racing Maserati, a man that's come into the championship this year after... Uh, racing in Italian GT cars last year. Right, pace car blasts off, and Maserati and KTM lead them away. So, still a, a good number of KTMs numerically, a very popular brand, because relatively speaking, it's a, a low-cost option to come into the championship. There are seven of them, five Mercedes, three Maseratis, a Porsche, and an Audi. Last year's champion, uh, Henri Hassad, and uh, Anthony Beltois, the Pro-Am champions, not on the grid this year, but Jan Krabec, who was the Am champion, steps up to Pro-Am, gets a co-driver in Matto Homola to go to Pro-Am. Uh, previous champions in Pro-Am, Stinus Longin and Nicholas Salens, also have moved on to other things, and the original champions in 2021, Anders Fjordbach and Mark Patterson, uh, have left the way clear for others to shine. So Carlo Tamburini and Reinhard Koffler start on the front row with Matto Homola and Simon Birch on row two. The third row is Gilles Vanillet and Philippe Pret. And then the fourth row uh, is going to be Jakob Matassen's KTM and Borgerman reaches number 61 Mercedes alongside. The fifth row, Loris Hesemans from GT3 to GT2. And then Dominic Olbert in the Razoon More Than Racing KTM alongside, ahead of Alexandre Leroy and Klaus Anghofer whose car had mechanical woes earlier on in the day. Christophe Bure next with Stefan Rattel alongside. Newcomer Patrick Dinkeldine has the experienced Jörg Wiebahn for company on row eight. And Lara Krahammer should be one to watch, I would have thought, from the back of the grid in the true racing KTM. That was a car that uh, was struggling for pace early on in the first race, Lara uh, Krahammer's KTM, but then picked up pace. She shares the car with Hubert Trunkenpolt, the T in KTM the Trunkenpolz family, but uh, Lara Crime, a very, very quick driver, and uh, got a little bit more out of that car. So, 
Number one, Maserati Carlo Tamburini threads out of the chicane on the Mistral, whereas the GT3 cars get the full interrupted blast of, what, a kilometre and a half and a bit, uh, all the way to senior for GT2 and GT4 with a, a, an AM element to the entry. Uh, so the chicane is put in on the Mistral just to make sure that they're not arriving at the final corner too quickly. Now, why do we have a Mercedes that is struggling way, way at the back of the pack and is not catching up? Somebody's got a problem by the look of it. Is that Jörg Vibarn's car? Possibly, because it was near the back of the grid. But as the field turns up towards scene, you can see that the last car should be Lara Kreimer's uh, KTM, which is there. But then we have a Mercedes that has fallen behind and it is, yes, Jörg Vibarn's car, 888. So maybe it had a problem, but has now caught back up uh, and will presumably have to start at the back of the grid because, uh, although it was on the penultimate row of the grid, once you are last away, you're not allowed to make up a place. And it does look like he's got a problem because you can see it slowing and going, slowing and going. So maybe Jörg Vibarn is trying to drive around a problem and just get the car into the race. There it looks OK, but you can see the way that it's sort of speeded up, slowed down, speeded up slowed down and it might be that he's trying to get heat into the brakes and that would accept, uh, uh, allow for drop back accelerate stand on the brakes and try and add some temperature into them that way but uh, Jörg Vibam then comes up towards the end of this formation lap and as he comes back into view has put himself back in his grid position anyway so Jörg Vibam from the eighth row, sharing this car with Stefan Perron, very experienced driver, Jörg Vibarn, uh, many, many years of GT4 racing. So if all is well with that Mercedes, uh, let's see what progress he can make once the race gets underway. And it's not far off doing so as the cars now uh, come towards the Verge de la Tour. Whether this race reaches the darkness remains to be seen, but we're at approaching five to seven local time in the evening. The light, once it starts to fade here, goes pretty quickly. And race two of Fanatec GT2 European Series, powered by Pirelli, is about to get underway. Race one winner, Carlo Tamburini, on pole position. His arch rival from the first race, Reinhard Koffler, alongside very experienced driver is Reinhard Koffler. And as the cars work their way now up towards the timing line, the lights blink green. We go racing. Good start by Tamburini. And Reinhard Koffler can do nothing about it in a straight line. So the KTM has to slot into second place. Look, the green KTM down towards turn one with Loris Hesemann's silver and orange Mercedes looking a bit squirrely in the mid-pack, but they've all survived turn one. Now into turn two, Tamburini from Koffler and then Simon Birch up to third. Whoops, drama in the background. One car off the road that possibly was the Vanderlei Mercedes. Borgerman Ricci was delayed in all of that. The drone is fifth, look, as they come down towards turn four. So look down from the drone as you see the cars work their way now down towards the Virage du Camp into turn five. That's the Matto Homola. KTM just going out of shot, the black and white car, and more fun and games as people run wide coming out of turn five. So there's been a real shuffle in the pack here. And Gilles Van Allee was indeed delayed at the start of the race. So the AM winner from race one has found himself with Jean-Luc Bobelink for steep two to do a lot of work here to get the car back into the mix. There, Patrick Dinkeldine's Porsche. On the defensive, as Gilles Van Allee's Mercedes tries to breathe in and make it three abreast up towards the chicane. They have cleared Lara Kreimer by the look of it, and also Stefan Rattel's Audi. So Van Allee's on a mission. Dinkeldine gets run out wide, and Rattel nips up and past him as well, as Tamburini goes wide, coming out of the chicane. Ryan Hockhoffler to the outside line now to try to go for the race lead. Can't do it on the outside line. Can he get the switch back to do the inside line down towards Senior? What well, he thinks about it. Simon Birch not that far behind either in the red and white KTM in third place. Through Le Bosse for the first time then in this 50 minute time race. Change for the lead because Reinhard Koffler has done it. And now Carlo Tamburini tries to fight back then. So the battle that was always about to happen in race one has happened early in race two. And now Reinhard Koffler, whose car is really good through the corners, whereas the Maserati seems to be better in a straight line. But it is game on, look, because Simon Birch is catching right up as well. Now Koffler going defensive, holding up the Maserati down to the Virage Dupont. Birch dives to the inside line, thinks better of it in third place then. Tamburini second as he crosses the stripe. And for third, the KTM's almost overlapping. Look, because there, Matter Homola in the black and white car lines up to have a go at Simon Birch down towards turn one. He's on the outside line, the longer line, and can't quite do it. They raw paintwork almost coming into the braking zone, but Simon Birch goes through. 
The incident on the first lap was uh, between Vanellet and Bonjamin Ricci, according to the message line on the timing screen. So that's been noted by race control. But the order, Koffler from Tamburini, Birch from Homola, uh, Dominic Olbert fifth, and Jakob Thassen sixth at the end of lap one. Loris Hesemann seventh, ahead of Philippe Pret, who is there in the Maserati just behind the drone. Now that's Hesemann's up the curb as he tries to get past Jakob and Tarsen uh, and the drone keeping pace with GT cars. Now onto the Mistral straight. Philippe Prett goes through. He's in eighth place. Bonjamin Ricci ninth behind and then the top ten rounded out by Jörg Wiebahn. So dramas we thought on the green flag lap not affecting Jörg Wiebahn in the race. He's making good progress as the third place KTM battle comes up towards the chicane and closing right up under braking there. The hard charging Matteo Homola as they turn now out of the chicane. That's Jörg Wiebahn. And Stefan Rattel has done the fastest lap of the race thus far, according to the timing screen. Uh, but it was not necessarily a representative lap, given that it was from the rolling start. Marshall rushing across the track in the background, just making me wonder whether something was dropped on the ground. But I think he's gone from one post to another, which is good news. The road is clear. 87 through then. So Gilles Vanillet, after he spin on the first lap, trying to press on his next target being Klaus Angerhoff as KTM. This is the third place battle where Matej Homola, Mato Homola, tries to go past Simon Birch. The KTM, same type of car, run by different teams, then nose to tail. And Simon Birch then hanging onto the place for the moment. His is the Razu more than racing car, the red and white one. The RTR Projects one is the Kravec Homola entry fourth. But look at the road because now Reinhardt Koffler, purple sector one, purple sector two, getting away, trying to strike while the Maserati's tires are cold, if you like, as he comes over the line because there is a discernible gap between the top two. 1.2 seconds, Koffler best lap of the race. Tamburini second from Bertram Homola from Dominic Olbert, whose car was eliminated early in race one. And then Jakob Matarsson in sixth. So five KTMs within the top six at the moment as there the field accelerates down towards turn four. Pit window 20 to 30 minutes and we've had just about five of those first 20 elapsed as the uh, Homola KTM rides the curb and gets sideways as well. Gilles Vanillet, by the way, up into 12th place now at the expense of Klaus Angerhoff for pushing on after his spin. And Lara Kreimer's KTM still struggling, still last, which is a surprise given that Lara is normally a pretty quick driver. Onto the Mistral and a bit wide in so doing goes Tamburini and Birch and Homola using all of the curb, maintaining the momentum, therefore. Uh, track limits now are being warned of for drivers, and amongst them, uh, the drivers that are, if you like, the offenders, including Loris Hesemans, uh, including also Simon Birch, and including Benjamin Ricci and Stefan Rattel. So drivers are being warned, and eventually, if you trigger enough warnings, then you head towards penalties being applied. So Reinhardt Koffler with no warnings, nor Carlo Tamburini in second place. They're clear, going through Senior and Birch and Homola together for third place. At the chicane, there is Patrick Dinkeldine's Porsche, run by Proton Competition. New to this championship, certainly not new to running Porsches. Very, very experienced team uh, going right back to pretty much the early days of FIA GT, the Proton squad. There is the man behind this category and GT3 and GT4 and everything GT, Stefan Rattel and his next target uh, is going to be Christoph Bure's Mercedes and he's not that far behind, that's for 7th and 8th within the class within the AM class as they go through and Stefan's Audi that uh, had a problem in the first race, stopped and went but uh, after that sort of cleared itself going stronger in this race Norris Hesemann's through number 98, Mercedes heads now towards the timing line, Norris Hesemann's who shares with Eric Dedonke, the one driver here racing this weekend who was on that original BPR uh, grid back in 1994. Still third, Simon Birch keeping Matta Homola at bay as they round turns one and two. And off the road, that was Simon Birch, so he carried too much speed into turn one. He's back on the road, but he's now lost the place. So through goes Matta Homola to take up third spot. And that means that Simon Birch has got to dig deep in order to try to fight back. No further investigation necessary for the Ricci Vanille drama is on lap one, so that sorts itself out. Ricci ninth at the mo moment, and Vanille is 12th. The KTMs head towards the Mistral straight once again, and Reinhardt Koffler's lead gap is coming down. It was eight tenths of a second last time over the line, having been 1.2 seconds a lap before. So there they are, Reinhardt Koffler, who will hand over to 
Martin Koch on the pit stops and Carlo Tamburini to Leonardo Garini in the Maserati having one race one here don't forget will serve a longer pit stop three seconds longer it will serve in the pit lane so even if uh, it gets ahead Koffler can stay within three seconds and in theory that KTM can take the lead back again once the pit stops have all cycled through. Look at the gap they've pulled already, though, over the squabble between Homola and Birch. Then for fifth, Dominic Olbert there goes through, ahead of in sixth place now, Jakob Benthassen. Hesemans is seventh, Philippe Pret eighth, Monchman Ricci ninth, and Jörg Viban goes through in tenth place. That's Alexandre Leroy's Maserati ahead of Gilles Vanillet. That's for 11th place overall, and for fourth in Am. And Vanillet wants to try to make progress because, of course, not only has he lost ground early on with that spin, he's also got a class win from race one 10 seconds extra time to serve in the pit lane to address once we get to the pit window so up towards Bendor they come through the left back onto the loud pedal and the road now sweeps right and then left through the virage de la Tour and then right through Virage Dupont up towards the timing line out of which then Reinhardt Koffler has come ahead of Tamburini Homola third as we saw from Birch from Albert from Matarsen so that's the race leader that's the 812 numbered KTM Reinhardt Koffler at the wheel of it who had a single seater start to his career uh, but then as the money ran out had many many years away from racing came back with KTM race these cars in not only GT2, but GT4 and the ADAC GT Championship. He was second in Pro-Am last year, Reinhardt Koffler. And for the moment, he's just pegged the gap to Tamburini to 1.3 seconds. So on the last lap, stretched it again. Carlo Tamburini pressing on, possibly uh, thinking that in the second stint, Leonardo Garini might be quicker than Martin Koch, but they've got to factor in that extra three seconds time they need to serve in the pit lane. Matha Homola getting away slightly from the lights flashing of Simon Birch down towards the chicane they come. Behind Simon Birch, fifth Dominic Olbert, and then Jakob Matthiasen's KTM closing up a little bit, the car that he will give over to Ronnie Bremer. Uh, there, Dominic Olbert is the Am Cup leader. He never got in the car in race one because of the retirement after it was tagged into a spin at the chicane, out of which he now comes. So uh, Dominic Olbert getting his only running of the day and going well, that's for sure. Jakob and Tarsen tucked up behind him, then Loris Hesemans in seventh place. Yellow flag shown in sector one. And it looks as though there's a mechanical drama, possibly for... Might be Stefan Rattel's car, in fact, in the first sector, looking at sector times from around the lap. That's kind of what happened in the first race. It had to do a control-alt-delete sort of restart. And yes, he's not got to the end of sector two, so uh, Stefan's Audi has got a gremlin somewhere, fingers crossed it can rejoin as up towards the end of the lap come the leaders, Reinhardt Koffler getting away, car 88 stopped and rejoined we are told, so yes again sort of reset, go again and Stefan Rattel rejoins the race, leaders go through, Koffler to Tamburini now two seconds, so the KTM now making good its escape from the Maserati there, third and fourth KTMs, uh, Matter Homola ahead of Simon Birch, and that is Jakob and Tarsen making a real send up the inside again ahead of Dominic Albert and goes through. So, mission accomplished. Goes through, goes wide, and Albert goes through. Do they touch? They certainly spin, and Loris Hesmans picks his moment and goes through. Off in avoidance goes Philippe Pret, but he survives as well. So, Dominic Albert and Jakob and Tarsen, a touch between the two, it seemed, and both spin, and neither have got going yet. So, yellow flags out within the first sector. Now, remember, the Dominic Albert KTM did not want to fire up after a spin in race one. We've now got two of them that are stranded after a spin in race two, and hopefully they can fire up. The yellow flags are still being shown in sector one. The rest battle on, the rest continue, but has that just done for those two KTMs if they're a bit reluctant to fire up after a spin when they're very hot? Through the chicane comes their Matto Homolet, Simon Birch behind him. And Albert and Batarsen have not got as far as Sector 2 as yet. That, and you can see the witness mark on the side of it, is Dominic Albert's car. Trying to get going, but again, they just seem to be so hot, they don't like to restart if they stall after a spin. And this is exactly what triggered the safety car in the first race. A KTM that just wouldn't fire up again and therefore had to be moved out of the way. This KTM going great guns, but its lead gap might diminish in a moment if we end up... Yes, we do, with a safety car. Safety car deployed. So for the second time today, safety car on track. And the 
field are all going to bunch up. And we're only about, what, seven minutes or so off a pit window, but I think we'll be clear by that stage. So in the second GT2 race of the day, safety car deployed. And this is what triggered it. Jakob Atarsen to the inside, went through, went wide. Dominic Olbert around the, the outside, and that's where there's that little touch between them. Matthiasen spins, and it was a long, lazy spin, if you like, for Dominic Olbert. But around he went, and from another angle, it looked like this. Look, Dominic Olbert on the outside, they just touch, oh so close, almost avoided it. Loris Hesemans was lucky to get through, and so was Philippe Pretz, as he had to scatter to the other side of the racetrack. Uh, and there, the two cars, I rather fear, have stayed. So all of these laps count within the 50 minutes. So. Michel Torval, the race director, scrambles the safety car. That picks up the leaders, uh, everybody in the queue. And then the recovery of those two cars can take place. Stefan Rattel, incidentally, into the pit lane. So sadly, the dramas are, are worse in this race than they were for the Audi in race one. So what he can, if he can't uh, rejoin the race, at least, is watch what should be a really good lead battle with everybody bunched up once again. And Reinhard Koffler will be furious about this, having pulled a good gap over Carlo Tamburini. He's got to do it again before he hands that car over to Martin Koch. The safety car will be in this lap. So again, it's a brief safety car period. So at the end of the lap, we'll go back racing again. The light's still on on that safety car. The Lamborghini coming up towards the chicane. Koffler, Tamburini, Homola, to the top three and Simon Birch will be creeping into the picture in the background in fourth place then. So the safety car, Lamborghini for this year as I've been mentioning during the course of the day here at Paul Ricard. Lights are flashing, comes out of the chicane and with uh, Lamborghini we don't see the Super Trofeo at every event as a support category this year, but we will certainly see lots of Lamborghinis, not only in terms of lead car, safety car, but also plenty on track in GT3 for Fanatec GT World Challenge Europe, powered by AWS. But the Lamborghini safety car leads them up to senior. We have had in the past Lamborghinis uh, in GT2 as well. It'd be great if we could get uh, a race version on the track also. Lights out on the Lamborghini safety car then. So uh, we'll go racing this time. Looks really good in the grey livery as well, doesn't it? The Lamborghini safety cars. It peels out of Le Bose. Up towards Bendor now. And when the safety car dives for the pit lane, it'll be Reinhard Koffler who's got to control the pace. And he will decide when he goes. What he will try and do is get the jump on Carlo Tamburini. And therefore be able to build a little bit of a gap, bearing in mind that Tamburini is uh, ready to go after him. Safety car will be in this time then. We are ready to go racing. And where does Reinhard Koffler accelerate? Not coming into Virage Dupont. He's going to leave it till the last moment, possibly. Carlo Tamburini accelerates out of the corner. Koffler pulls the pin now and accelerates clear over the timing line. Race back on. Green flag shows then. And we're back racing here at Paul Ricard as the leaders go through. And Reinhard Koffler, six tenths of a second to the good then as they go down towards turn one. And through on the inside there, Simon Birch. Loris Hesmans having gone ahead of him in a straight line, but under breaking the KTM, goes back up to fourth place. So Hesemans uh, thrown a lifeline really with that safety car, brought the gap down. Look down from that epic drone shot as the cars run down towards turn four. Through the right, through the left, and then down to Virage du Camp. And contact between uh, Albert and Matarsen under investigation that triggered that safety car period. So just under four minutes before the pit window opens. If you are the quicker of the two drivers, you'll probably stay in for as long as possible. Koffler particularly will want to stay out to give Martin Koch a good chance and would have fallen in the lead. Tamburini arguably quicker than Gorini, so he might well stay out. But look at the way that Koffler has absolutely disappeared up the road once again. And now, in fact, uh, maybe this was the plan to try to get the other KTMs onto the back of the Maserati at the Virage Dupont. Uh, Tamburini being attacked by Matto Homola. Simon Birch fourth. And there in fifth place is Loris Hesemans as the cars accelerate once more onto the Mistral straight. So through they turn, up now towards the right-hander of Signe and Philippe Pret in the background there in the Maserati number two, the other LP racing run car. 
trying to fend off the challenge of Bordramao Ricci, who is behind. Pret is the current AM leader, incidentally. Uh, Jörg Vibarn is second, despite the fears that we had on the green flag lap for him. And Alexander Leroy in the yellow Maserati is in third place. Bordramao Ricci, seventh overall, sixth in the Pro AM class. He'll give the car over to his father, Mauro Ricci, for the second stint. And the leaders now dance their way up towards the end of lap number eight with Reinhardt Koffler looking good. And remember, he's got a slightly, slightly shorter pit stop to serve than uh, Colo Tamburini's car, which is the one doing the chasing at the moment. Three seconds, the difference between them, the difference between a win and second place in that earlier race when you take the compensation times into account. Leaders go through once more then. Fastest lap is Reinhardt Koffler, and he's just done that. Two minutes, 5.068. Again, look down from the drone, and you can see the fastest lap confirmed for Koffler. You can see where the battles are with Tamburini and Homola together pretty much for second place now, going down towards turn four. So Reinhardt Koffler away and gone, and Carlo Tamburini, even though he did an absolute best in the last sector last time, is coming under attack from Matthias Homola. That's Philippe Pratt just ahead of us. So that means that the drone is currently seventh as it goes through turn six. And the leader, Reinhardt Koffler, pretty much on his own as Carlo Tamburini now in the Maserati there has to think about how he's going to keep Homola at bay. Matter Homola from touring cars, both in uh, Europe, both in TCR uh, Europe International and, of course, the WTCR series, right there on the back of GT experts these days, but one-time touring car driver Carlo Tamburini. Onto the Mistral, they come once more. So the battle is on for second place. The Maserati with the KTM so close, it's almost hidden as they come up the brow towards Senior, that very, very fast right-hander, out of which they now turn. And Homola accelerates on towards Le Bose, dropping a length. But the Maserati a little bit twitchy there as Tamburini breaks as late as he can for that long, long corner. Hard really to know exactly which apex to go for. You sort of need two bites at it. So deep in and then cut across, kind of V off the corner, if you like. Homola right up behind the Maserati, through they turn. And for the back markers, the pit window will be open this time. For the front runners, they need to do another lap. So uh, if you're towards the rear of the field, you could get your pit stop out of the way imminently. But for Koffler, Tamburini and Homola, who are the quicker drivers anyway in these cars, uh, another lap will be required and they'll probably stay out for as long of this 10 minute window as they possibly can. So over the line goes Reinhardt Koffler. Carlo Tamburini in second place, that gap 2.7 seconds and another fastest lap by Reinhardt Koffler. Uh, now as the temperature starts to drop, that's going to help the pace of the cars a little bit. Two minutes, 4.9 now done by Koffler. Through he goes, 2.7 seconds to the good. This is the fight for second place, Tamburini versus Homola. Run through together and then Simon Birch in fourth place. Loris Esmonds is fifth, Philippe Pret sixth. So at the moment, Carlo Tamburini seemingly unable to do anything about Koffler, but he is doing a good job, at least, of keeping uh, Homola at bay. Did anybody go for the pit lane at the end of the previous lap? The answer is no. So everybody still in driver one mode. But now Mato Homola looking as though he's going to line up for an attack, possibly on the way towards the chicane. Tamburini thinks he knows what's coming and tries to defend in the middle of the road. Homola goes to the very, very inside, breaks as late as he can. And just about does it, squeezes up the inside and gets the car slowed down in time. That was a good pass. So Matthew Homola goes through. That puts him up into second place. And third for this Maserati is the lowest it has been all day. So slightly strange that the KTMs that didn't seem to have the outright pace in race one are now one and two in the second race. So Carlo Tamburini comes towards Le Bosse, possibly having to be mindful of Simon Birch, who is fourth, and he would have seen the KTMs attack the Maserati and think, well, I can do that as well. Mercedes battle is on here. Gilles Vanillet goes through. And behind uh, Vanillet and also your V-Barn's car, you've got the Alexandre Loire Maserati. That's Koffler, who stays out for one more lap behind him should be Matto Homola, who stays out for another lap. And into the pit lane comes Carlo Tamburini. So pretty much about a lap before halfway, I will offer you as that. It's going to be Tamburini to give away to Leonardo Gorini. And as he comes in, so interestingly, does the sister car of Philippe Pret. So LP Racing going to have to sort of double stack here. They've got both the Maseratis in. There's plenty of space in the pit lane. And 
a long stop anyway with an extra 10 seconds to serve for that car just going out of shot. Whereas for third in class, Philippe Pret has to serve five extra. So it is 128 seconds plus the penalty you get for being first, second or third in the earlier race. So 10 seconds for the number one uh, Maserati for being the race winner. And it's five for being third in class for Philippe Pret. And the current leading car will serve seven seconds because that's the compensation time you get for being second in your class. And it's the same time scale for the top three, whether it's Pro-Am or Am. So Leonardo Guarini takes over number one. Philippe Pret will go back out in number two. And now Reinhard Koffler comes out of the chicane up towards Signe. And he's on his own with Matho Homeler in second place. That car of Homola, five seconds to serve for being third in class in race one. And the clock ticks on down as Leonardo Gorini, race one winner, is strapped into the car. So two minutes and eight seconds plus 10 for this. So two minutes 18 we're looking at for the uh, number one Maserati. And it's up to the car controller now to release that car. So it clicks the beam at the end of the pit lane, bang on cue rather than being under. Uh, slightly over is not too bad. It penalises yourself, but at least you're safe. But being under, it's a real no-no. Uh, the teams do get a joker second, but anything the wrong side of that, you're in real strife, and you can only use it in uh, one of the two races. Right, engine will fire, and then on instruction, Leonardo Garini will head down the pit lane, and there out before, because it's a shorter stop to serve, Philippe Prep gets away, and now Garini behind him. So you can see how the compensation time in the pits will affect the order and it means that Gorini's got quite a bit more overtaking to do. Also, the cars feeding back in after their pit stops will mix with cars that are still on the lead lap yet to pit, so the order becomes very jumbled indeed and suddenly quick cars after a stop might find themselves in kind of midfield traffic, not running at their pace, making life that little bit tougher. Koffler, though, still got this clear road ahead of him as he comes through in 8-1-2. The KTM uh, run by the MZR Motorsport Zentrum Reed team. That's 89, Matter Homola's car in second place. He will give way to last year's AM champion, Jan Kravic. But Koffler now trying to make even more of this lead. However, Homola has done the fastest lap of the race behind him. Two minutes 4.8 for Matej Homola. Two minutes 4.9 is the best that Koffler has done. So now that Homola has clear road ahead of him, he is another one digging deep and pushing on as through the chicane comes Reinhard Koffler. Back onto the power. Out of the chicane goes Matteo Homola. And in sector one, just by hundreds, he's slightly slower than Koffler. And an absolute best sector two offered up by the race leader then. So Reinhard Koffler trying to retaliate, except Homola goes even quicker in sector two. So now Homola trying to prove that he is a top dog within the KTM battle. Uh, number. 10 is under investigation, which is Jakob Matthiasen, who did rejoin the race uh, for his pit stop time. He's handed the car over to Ronnie Bremer, but that car is under the two minutes, eight second mark. So after his spin, uh, Matthiasen's day not getting a whole lot better. It's uh, a shame to say. Both the KTMs, in fact, having been hooked out of the way, have rejoined the race. So they've uh, continued to circulate, albeit uh, quite a long way back, but they have been allowed to continue. Big puff of smoke there coming out of the back of Homola's KTM as he chases Koffler across the line. Simon Birch likewise staying out for another lap. Koffler, new fastest lap of the race, two minutes, 4.6, and a two minutes, 4.9 from Homola. So net advantage Koffler on that lap as they go through. Alexandre Leroy's Maserati is said he saw his KTM has just rejoined. That was a car that dropped out of race one. So the order continues to shuffle as all these pit stops cycle through. And plenty of track limit warnings and driving standards flags. Uh, one to Lara Kreimer and a five second penalty to be served by Lara when she makes the pit stop in number 17. So the car was at the back of the grid. It wasn't looking all that pacey early on and a five second penalty will go that car's way on the pit stop so it's not a penalty by being in the top three in the earlier race it is a penalty for uh, track limit transgressions number 17 ktm uh, has now had 
seven track limit warnings and six is enough to get you a penalty. So Ryan Hockkoffler continues. He's on lap 13 into the second half of the race now as he comes up towards Senior through that fast right. Martin Koch will take over that car for the second stint. And it will be Jan Krabic to take over number 89. As far as the AM class is concerned, Gilles Vanillet, the current leader, ahead of Jörg Vibarn. Vibarn with no extra time to serve in the pits when he hands over that car uh, to Stefan Perram, whereas Vanillet will have to serve, or at least Jean-Luc Bobelik, the incoming driver, will have to serve 10 seconds because of winning the AM category earlier on in the day. Leader pits, in comes Reinhardt Koffler, leader to the pit lane. So 8.12 comes in. And what about 89, the black and white KTM? Let's see whether it stays out for one more lap. He's running it close if he does. I would have thought they've all got to come in this time, actually, looking at the clock. The first car you see in the pit lane is Alexandre Leroy's Maserati. That's rejoining. And so in comes Koffler, in comes Homola, in comes Birch, in comes Hesemans, in comes Ricci, in comes Vanille. Yeah, pretty much everybody that's not yet pitted has to do it this time. So they're going through is... Leonardo Gorini's car, number one in the background. Uh, this is Philippe Pret, who puts himself now back onto the lead lap and is the leading pit stopper. So he's on the lead lap, but we need to see where this car is when it feeds back in, because uh, this car will start lap 14. It has done 13, whereas just onto lap 13 has gone uh, Philippe Pret. So remember, it's... Uh, 128 seconds plus seven for that car for being second in its class earlier on in the day. Mechanic strap in Martin Koch there with a slightly shorter stop of two seconds. Uh, the difference for now Jan Krabic to serve as he will take over from Mato Homola. So number two, Maserati of Philippe Pret, number one, Maserati of Leonardo Gorini are back on the lead lap, but where will they be when those other KTMs rejoin the race is the answer. There is about half a minute or so of the pit stop to serve on the clock, plus the compensation time for 8.12 and 8.9 sitting in the pit lane. So they should still be good to come out in front. Leonardo Gorini, who came into this championship as a Porsche driver, now with the Maserati and a race winner too. Uh, Martin Koch awaits the signal. Don't go yet, don't go yet, say the team. They've got to try and time this, so the drive time also with the compensation time, clicks over absolutely perfectly. Away he goes now, the car uh, a long way down the uh, pit lane. So goes past that midpoint over the timing line, heads down towards turn one. Uh, Simon Birch, look, now handing over number uh, 80 KTM to Thomas Anderson, jumps ahead of Jan Krabetsch. And they're going to stay ahead of the Maseratis because as they rejoin the road, the Maseratis are only now coming out of the Virage du Pont. So actually, if you look at the number of cars rejoining the racetrack, the Maseratis have really been shuffled down the order. So the pit stops didn't feel slow. But they've lost an absolute chunk of time somewhere, have they not? There you can see Pret going through. Behind him is Gorini. But uh, they've gone through, having been dealt in a sense a pretty bad hand. Look at the amount of time lost. Whereas, number one Maserati was in that third place and they've only had to lose three seconds against this car. Well, it's a much, much bigger gap than three seconds now, as you can see. Martin Koch then goes through. So, two minutes, 15.9, his pit stop time. Staying ahead of Jan Krabic. Eric Dodonka has taken over number 98. Uh, and Eric Dodonka in third place right now uh, for the one driver in the event this weekend who was here 30 years ago on the BPR grid. It would be great if he were to be on the podium. Let's see whether it pans out that way. There is just going through shot, the silver and orange Mercedes that he drives. Mauro Ricci in 61 accelerates through now ahead of uh, Stefan Perrin, who's taken over that Mercedes 888 from Jörg Vibarn. So as the cars come up through Signe, the Maserati team, one rather fears, left scratching their heads, thinking, how's all that unraveled around us? The track limits now, because of different drivers in the cars, have all been uh, reset. And Stefan Perrin under investigation for the pit stop time, because two minutes five, which was the pit stop, is definitely not uh, two minutes eight, which is the regulation time. So, triple eight Mercedes 
may well cop a penalty. Uh, and we'll see where that's going to drop it to if and when a penalty is applied. At the moment, the car leads Am, but the uh, frustration is it may well not do for much longer. Uh, Philippe Pratt is about to try to get his class lead back. Through he goes, up on the inside there. Philippe Pratt goes through, but the line's a little bit strange as a consequence of that, because to dive past, he was offline coming to Virage Dupont, but he survives. Philippe Pratt goes through. So it is Martin Koch in the lead from Thomas Anderson up to second now. Jan Krabetsch down to third, Eric Dodonka fourth, Mario Ricci fifth, Philippe Pratt sixth. Seventh is Stefan Perrant there. Eighth is the car that was third when it came into the pit lane. Number one, Leonardo Gorini. Now maybe that was down to Gorini's lap times just not being as quick as the others in that earlier stint because Gorini took over. He was lapping in the two minute sixes, whereas we know that Koffler and uh, Homola were doing two minutes four. So if you add those over two or three laps, that again is going to have an impact on why number one fell away. Partly the pace of the driver, potentially partly the longer pit stop added all together. And that's why it has fallen back into eighth place. So now Leonardo Guarini has got work to do. No question about it as Martin Koch comes up to the chicane. Through the left and the right, left again. As for second place now, Jan Krabec goes ahead of Thomas Anderson. Look, so the black and white KTM of last year's AM champion regains track position. And Thomas Anderson down to third. And it's a big gap between those three now. And in fourth place in the background, Eric Dadonka who was one of the early drivers on a, a BPR grid and a GT4 grid and uh, an FIA GT3 European Championship grid as well, if you recall that SRO series. There is Philippe Pret leading in AM. And he's put himself ahead of the class opposition now, even if there is a penalty uh, for Triple Eight potentially. So Philippe Pret just has to bring this home now. He'd like to gain places overall, but the main aim is to be uh, an AM class winner. And he's in exactly the right place at the moment, so to do. So he blasts on up towards the end of the lap. Philippe Pret, Ferrari Challenge uh, class champion. And he's right on the back of Eric Dodonko as he comes up towards the line. It was a pretty big gap at the start of the lap. As the three KTMs go through, 2.2 seconds between Koch and Kravec. And last time around, ever so slightly quicker was Kravec in second place. And when I say slightly, I mean by 17 thousandths of a second. There Eric Dodonka down towards turn one. The Belgian driver with Philippe Pratt rattling the curbs behind him. 15 more minutes of the race still to run, and a place is certainly to be gained, I think, for Pratt. He's looking so, so strong, and the Maserati lines up for a big dive on the inside and goes through down to Virage de l'Hotel. Job done. Through he goes. As If you look left, you'll see the end of the airstrip. Uh, then hard on the brakes, go right. That little loop that uh, brings the cars back towards the Mistral Strait blue uh, friction paint on the side of the road rather than gravel traps here you have that to try and slow the cars down and it gives that really swirly feel to the Paul Ricard circuit drivers often find it uh, a little bit difficult to find their reference points but you can see there the marker boards telling them where the chicane is 50 meter countdown and then stand on the brakes and thread it between the curbs here there's Gorini so he in turn is pushing on closing on to Donka he's gone ahead of Mauro Ricci, so Leonardo Gorini not giving up, that's for sure, but you see the way that this is a completely different look to the race and the race order than we had in race one and how also those uh, pit stop compensation penalties come in as well. There is Gorini then out of senior. Makes the run on now to Lavose, closing up onto the tail of Eric Dedonka. And Eric Dedonka is another one in Pro-Am, so this is a legit battle, if you like. Two cars in the same class. Eric Dodonka needs to try to fend him off. Loris Hesman's having done a good opening stint in that car, but Gorini, just look at the closing speed. He certainly has the pace to jump ahead of Dodonka by the end of the lap now. Gorini faints to one side, thought about forcing the issue. Dodonka goes wide, opens the door, but that gives Gorini the outside line, but he's done it anyway. Down towards Virage Dupont, so through he goes. And a good pass by the tail wagging Maserati. Through up one more spot, that puts it now into fifth as he comes up towards the line. So Koch, Kravec, Anderson, a one, two, three for KTM. Fourth is Pret, fifth Gorini now. Sixth is Dedonka, down to seventh has gone Ricci in the background. Eighth is Jean-Luc Bobelic. 
the Anne winner earlier on in the day. But this lead gap's coming down, isn't it? Jan Krabic going after Martin Koch and doing a really good job of it because the margin is down to 0.9 of a second now. To the Mistral one sport and just look at those last three laps from Krabic. Quicker, quicker, quicker than the car he's chasing. He's almost on the back and he's taken another four tenths out in sector one alone. The closer you get, the more perhaps it spurs on a driver. And Jan Krabic fainting to the inside, coming up to the chicane, thinking about making a move there, but that's not going to work. Slots back in behind. Out of the chicane. And dare one suggest that Martin Koch is now feeling the pressure because the car was a little bit wider through the chicane than was Krabic. So now Martin Koch trying to fend him off. You can see in the background Thomas Anderson falling away a little bit. Koch defends up towards Senior. Krabic all over the back of him. Out of the right-hander, that short run towards Le Bosse. And once they turn out of the corner, that long, long right takes them up towards Bendor. So the race leaders on this 17th lap. Not only are they arguing for the outright lead, but also, of course, for honours in Pro-Am. And you get points in your respective class. So the leaders come up towards Bendor, then the Virage de la Tour, here it is, and that margin is probably, what, two lengths, if that, between Martin Koch and Jan Krabic, who has now got 11 minutes in which to think about where he can make his move. Up towards the Virage du Pont, they come towards the timing line now, and Martin Koch, dare he think about a race win, or is he on borrowed time here, because Krabic is just looking that little bit stronger, and look at the way that he's closing, closing. A fifth of a second is the margin as they come over the line. Krabic goes to the inside, has a look, can't find a way through there. Now, Martin Koch doesn't have to have a massive margin as long as he wins, but the win is what he wants to do. So he cannot afford now to let Krabic get a sniff of victory. Cannot afford to let him up alongside as they come down towards the uh, Virage de l'Hotel. Go right, go left, and then stand on the brakes for the sharp right at Virage du Camp out of which they will turn towards saint -Bohm. turn six. The two KTMs virtually as one now, as you look down from the drone, coming up towards the turn seven left-hand kink that brings them back onto the Mistral straight. And ten and a half minutes now on the clock. So Jan Krabic will be focusing on the KTM ahead. You can see the natural light just starting to fade a little bit as the headlights are having more of an impact. But I don't think we're going to have to worry about darkness uh, before... The race finishes, that's for sure, uh, in early spring here at Le Castellet. Through the chicane then, Koch to Kravec, and in sector one, Koch was the quicker on this lap. Thomas Anderson is still third, but falling away and being caught now by Philippe Pret. So there, look, in the background is Anderson, and you can see the Maserati getting a little bit nearer. So the lead battle is the one to watch, but third could change within the remaining 10 minutes of the race. As there, Thomas Anderson comes up through senior, Philippe Pret fourth, and he's taking Leonardo Garini with him as well. Garini lapping quicker than the two ahead of him. So third, fourth, fifth, concertinering in these uh, final 10 minutes, the last fifth of the race, as the leaders come through. Martin Koch still ahead of Jan Krabic, who came out of the 24-hour series, the Kreventic series, coming to GT2 and a champion last year in Am. Martin Koch sets the car up for the last corner, needs a good exit here to maintain that momentum over the line. And Jan Krabic is being warned about track limit offences. He's got two warnings now to the one of Koch. So uh, six is really the danger zone, but they go through together. Half a second being the margin between those two. Thomas Anderson for third, Philippe Pret fourth, and the margin third to fourth is under a second. So that's going to change by the end. And then Gorini is 11 tenths back in fifth place. As you look at the race leader on the drone, Starts the chase once more. The two KTMs go underneath it down towards turn four. And so Martin Koch hanging on to position. Jan Krabic, there he is. You're riding on the rear wing of the car. Goes through turn four. And now it looks as though ever so slightly Martin Koch just a bit further away. But for third place, Thomas Anderson goes wide. Let's Philippe Press up the inside. Maserati versus KTM. The Maserati has got the pace. Goes round the outside. Thomas Anderson has to give way. And so Philippe Press 
up to third overall as well as being the leader in class. And here comes Gorini to try to follow suit. Yep, job done. So the two Maseratis go by, and now Gorini has a go at his teammate to try to retake third place, which is where the car was when it pitted. And Gorini gets it done under braking. And look, a rather cheeky Thomas Anderson dives bombs as well. So Anderson, uh, two down and one up there. And Philippe Pratt suddenly scratching his head, thinking, what's happened here? I've gained a place, now I've lost two. So he fights back coming out of the chicane. Really good opportunistic move by Thomas Anderson there. But Philippe Pratt now does go back ahead and says, just, you know, remember what was going on. I was ahead of you. So the Maserati clearing to senior job done. But uh, hat tip to Thomas Anderson for being cheeky there, for following in the toe of Gorini and diving back up the inside. I think Pret gave Gorini plenty of room, seeing that they're in the same team and in different classes. And Anderson thought, I'm going for this. And it worked briefly. So now Leonardo Gorini up into third place, but I fear he's too far back from the KTMs to really be a threat with seven minutes to go for anything better than third place here. Goes down through the gears into the Virage de la Tour. And then down to second, and in fact down to first, as he gets into the sharp right itself. And then release the car out of the corner and up through the gears, speed building all the time over that little brow there in the pit straight. Drop down to turn one. And I was mentioning earlier on about the Jörg Vibahn, Stefan Perrin, Mercedes being investigated for a short pit stop. It will get 13 seconds added at the end of the race. And also the Ronnie Bremer now driven Jakob and Tarsen started KTM gets 10 seconds of a time penalty at the end of the race for being short on the pit stop as well. But still, uh, it is Martin Koch ahead of Jan Krabic. So the KTMs run one and two. And in that same order that we had at the start of the stint, so Krabic remains on the tail. And there is Gorini. Now, his last lap was a 2 minutes 6.7. Uh, the leader, 2 minutes 8. So he's over a second a lap quicker. And he's now got to make up four seconds to the leader. And all of a sudden, Leonardo Gorini has an opportunity, perhaps, with what have we got left? Just under six minutes to get second place. He would like the KTMs to get together and start squabbling. But right now, Leonardo Gorini is absolutely charging. The KTMs perhaps a bit more focused on their own situation, not going as quickly as that Maserati. And word needs to get through to them because Martin Koch leading Jan Krabic, there they both are. But there in third place is the flying Leonardo Gorini. Behind him is the class leading Philippe Pretz and the other LP Racing Maserati. And then uh, fifth is Thomas Anderson and sixth now Jean-Luc Bobelic. And Koch getting away from Krabic. So having had the car absolutely nose to tail, it's now one second between them. And as Krabic drops away, so that means that he's falling into the clutches of Gorini. And that might save Koch, mightn't it? Because if Gorini gets onto the back of Krabic and has to fight past him, it'll take some of the pressure off the race leader, potentially. Here they come, five minutes to go. So what have we got? Three laps for the leaders out of the Virage Dupont. There's the race one winning Maserati, the car that debuted here at the back end of last year, and it comes up towards the line, goes through. Martin Koch over a second now, clear of Jan Krabic, who is 1.8 ahead of Leonardo Guarini. The last lap for Guarini, a 2 minutes 5.8 and 2 minutes 8 for the two leading KTM. So Leonardo Guarini now much quicker than the two ahead of him. Not the fastest lap of the race, that was done in the fours by Koffler earlier on. And again, it shows you the difference of uh, Pro-Am racing, different pace of drivers, which makes the fascination right the way to the very end here. Can Gorini take second? He's only three seconds off the outright lead. So maybe that's stretching the point a little bit, but he's certainly not giving up. Gorini here comes out of uh, turn six onto the Mistral, which is where the Maserati, as it can on the pit straight, stretch its legs. And they go through together now. So KTM's covered by just over a second. And in the first sector of the lap, Krabic quicker than the leader. So he's quickening his pace because he knows what's coming. It's there. It's number one, Maserati getting closer, closer, closer. Leonardo Gorini comes through now in third place, inching up onto the tail of the traffic ahead of him. Once more, they come up towards Senior. And Martin Koch still in the lead of the race. But Jan Krabic having to up his pace, partly, of course, to shake off Gorini, uh, partly because he quite like one last chance at going for outright honours in this second round of Fanatec GT2 European Series 
powered by Pirelli. This is Gorini's view, and where, as what, two laps ago, three laps ago, those KTMs were miles up the road. Now he is right with them. They are filling the windscreen, and that gives him even more reason to push. And we will get two more laps out of the race, looking at the clock as they come now towards Verage Dupont. Gorini right up behind Kravetch. Go away, think the KTM drivers. Gorini, though, has a sniff of a win here. Three seconds covered first to third last time. This time over the line. First to third is 11 tenths of a second. Gorini is absolutely on a mission. Don't rule him out yet. Third gear into turn one. Now turn two. Bit of a lift back on the power. Rattles the curb on the outside of the road. Not quite in striking distance of Jan Krabetz. He was four tenths behind him over the line. The KTMs like this section. They're nimble. They're good through the corners. So Gorini having to break late. Is there a gap on the inside at turn five? The answer is no. And they won't really be at six, I don't think. Martin Koch hangs on to the race lead. Longest last couple of laps of his life, this. The only good news for him is that Krabetz is there between him and Gorini. But look at the way the Maserati gets the acceleration onto the straight. Krabetz tries to defend, shows the only way around is the outside line for Leonardo Gorini. But Gorini's going to get the job done, is he? Krabetz has to be late, 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 late on the brakes coming into the corner. He does try to be late, and he does so. Goes back on the inside and retakes second place. Well done, Jan Krabetz. That was brave stuff. Defended well. He knew he didn't have the speed to keep the Maserati at bay, so he put the Maserati on the outside and then was able to brake as late as he could. And Gorini urging himself on, shouting away inside the car. He's running out of corners, he's running out of time, he's running out of laps. There'll be one, two go at the end of this. So you can see where the Maserati is strong. But I think had he been able to clear Kravetz, he would have done Koch on the next lap. So that's given Martin Koch for the moment a get out of jail free card. And again, through the corners, the KTMs in their element, keeping the Maserati at bay. Krabetz catching the leader. So now first, second, third, absolutely tied together as they come up towards the Virage de la Tour. Krabetz is the one in the really hard situation. He's trying to attack, he's trying to defend, and he can't not afford to leave that door ajar. And he's right on the back of Koch. And here comes Gorini. He's got past one. He's got past two of them. Or has he? Because now it's Koch on the outside line. And Gorini's got a problem. There was contact, I think. The hazard lights came on as the car suddenly slowed. And he's back down to third place again. So drama as they come to the start of the final lap. Not only has Gorini dropped away, he's also in the clutches of Philippe Pret. So over the line they go. The order is unchanged. But we briefly had them three wide. We had briefly Kravetz ahead of Koch as they came out of the corner. Yes, there was definitely contact. Look, because the bodywork flaps on the Maserati. And a big spin for Gorini, around he goes. On the last lap, Leonardo Gorini, after a great driver's gone off the racetrack, past him, goes Philippe Pret. And can Leonardo Gorini get the Maserati fired up and rejoin then? Yellow flag showed in sector one. Wow, a race of drama. So this was what happened at the last corner of the penultimate lap look. Suddenly, the KTM of Jan Kravetz got caught up behind a slow Martin Koch. The door opened, there was the contact. That put out wide Gorini, and it's almost like the car stalled. Now, it was Martin Koch who was slow, and so Kravitz dived past him on one side, and then there was the contact with the Maserati. Koch all the way around the outside of the pair to retake the lead. Right, so half a lap to go. Whether anything needs looking at out of that, because you might argue that being way out wide and off the road, Koch gains an advantage. However, he is the race leader. Jan Kravec is second. Uh, third runs Philippe Pret, and Leonardo Gorini has not got going. Bitter gall after such a good drive to get the car back into contention. So Martin Koch has had a bit of a charmed life here. Everything that Jan Kravec and others have thrown at him, he's just about been able to swat aside. Uh, but can he do so for one? more lap. Here they come then up towards the last few corners of what's been a very, very lively second race. Out wide goes Koch. This is Kravitz's chance to go for the lead and he's done it. Mistake on the last lap for Martin Koch. Off the road and back on again. Has he undone all of Koffler's good work from the first stint? I think he has because Jan Kravitz goes through them. So we've got three different leaders in about a lap and a bit. There's more leaning between the two of them. Martin Koch tries to fight back. But Jan Kravec comes off the corner ahead. Martin Koch tries to go one side, can't do it. Kravec defends, checkered flag at the ready, and it is a win just for Jan Kravec and for Mato Homola.
second, Martin Koch and Reinhard Koffner, the margin seven one hundredths of a second. Fantastic race between the two, a virtual dead heat then, 71 thousandths or seven hundredths if you prefer, the margin between the two. Philippe Prett comes home for third place and a win in Am. Uh, fourth, Thomas Anderson in the KTM that he shares with Simon Birch. Fifth, to Jean-Luc Bobelic and Gilles Vanillet. And amazingly enough, despite being uh, a spinner early on and causing a safety car, sixth, Ronnie Bremer and Jakob Atarsson. So having lost the lead, Martin Koch tries to fight back in replay coming through Virage de Tour and gets into the side of Jan Krabach. She says, no, I'm going to win this race and comes out of the corner ahead. So it's the one lap that that car has led, but it's the one that counts. So Mato Homola and Jan Krabic come through to win a very, very lively Fanatec GT2 European Series Race 2. And uh, they'll make their way around to Park Ferme and then to the podium. So Pro-Am honours to uh, Krabic and Homola. Koch and Koffler second and third in class, Thomas Anderson and uh, Simon Birch in Am. Philippe Prep the winner. Bobelie and Vanille take second and Alexandre Leroy once more on the podium at this time in third place. So uh, really good racing, no question about it in the GT2 European Series. A bigger entry than we've had hitherto, better racing as well, more cars, more battling. And I think we're in for a good year, aren't we, for the uh, burgeoning GT2 class. The drivers then head towards the pit lane. Fastest lap, Reinhardt Koffler, but uh, that car that led the bulk of the race pretty much, if you exclude the pit stops, every lap except the last one. Uh, and in the end, lost out by seven hundredths of a second. Reinhardt Koffler, I suspect, will be not ecstatic about that result, but these things do happen in Pro-Am racing. And uh, Martin Koch just making that small error on the end of the penultimate lap that lost the car pace, and it meant that everyone suddenly bunched up around him and then also making a little error right at the very end. And that's what did for them as far as the lead was concerned. Well, no question, we've had some excellent racing and uh, more of the same to look forward to you during the season. And I think now that uh, with strong entries triggering more cars to come in, nobody wants to join a weak championship, but now that this is looking strong, I think others will be uh, rather more interested in signing up. So we are in for a really good year and it will run with the uh, GT World Challenge Europe races over the course of the year. Jan Kravec and Matteo Homola then take the win from Martin Koch and Reinhard Koffler. And then for third place, uh, soloist Philippe Pret. Fourth, Thomas Anderson and Simon Birch ahead of Jean-Luc Bobelic and Gilles Vanillet. Alexandre Leroy taking sixth. Seventh, Ronnie Bremer and Jakob Antarsson. Eighth, Eric Dodonka, who dropped away, uh, but with Lawrence Hesemann's eighth was his reward. Pascal Givon and Christophe Bure ninth. And Seti Sarmini and Klaus Angerhofer round out the top ten. Uh, Eleventh for Patrick Dinkeldein from Dennis Lebo and... Dominic Olberts delayed after a spin KTM and then out of the race Leonardo Guarini and Carlo Tamburini after all Guarini's efforts that car did not get to the end we lost the reaches as well uh, we lost the trunk and Poltons and Kreimer KTM and poor old Stefan Rattel also uh, his Audi not wanting to play ball today and a retirement early on in the race so there is the delighted Jan Kravec who's about to step out of the car out he wriggles and an outright win rather than just a class win always a good thing and he now goes to look for co-driver Matho Homola so he can celebrate the team is there however ready to say well done others arriving noisily in the pit lane photos taken and uh, Others making their way down the pit road. There is Martin Koch. Second place is good. A second, second of the day, but coming so close to a race win, I think he'll be uh, somewhat frustrated, to say the least, that it didn't quite go as they were hoping. So there, are the KTM crossbow, the GT2. A car designed for this championship, of course, this regulation rule set. Reinhardt Koffler is there, ready to open the door, help his co-driver out of the car, and to say, uh, what happened then on the last lap? But even so, second place is a decent result. And if you think long-term for the championship, it's points. 
Martin Koch out of the car. And if only, he thinks, if we hadn't had that last lap. Because he led onto it, but not at the end of it. So the winning car led but once over the timing line, and it was when the chequered flag was there. Martin Koch held it off, and we'll uh, reflect on that race with Reinhard Koffler. Jan Kravec, then race winner, along with Matto Hommel's help, and uh, Antonio Rankin is with him. Jan, congratulations. That is one of the best last laps we have seen in ages. Talk me through it. No, it was the toughest race I've had, obviously. Uh, the first time in Pro-Am, uh, I was not surprised, but I saw that I have to push very hard for the, all those quick guys that are here. Uh, even in the first race, I was struggling a little bit in the, fir in, in the beginning. But now, I mean, it's amazing. Uh, very tough race. Absolutely. Of course, you nearly came together at the end. How did you mentally go around that? I mean, there have, there, have, there have been a few very difficult moments. Uh, I don't know what happened to, uh, to Koch because he was very slow in the last corner, so nobody knew what was going on. I was inside. Uh, Gorini was outside. There was a contact. Unfortunately, I couldn't do anything about it. And then we were racing until the very end. And yeah, luckily, I was the first one. <laughs> Absolutely fantastic. Thank you very Thank much. You. And uh, Martin Koch there talking to the team. And uh, you can see the frustration, oh, so close to a win. Uh, we'll send Antonia to go and have a word and see if she can get the story. The car was slow, as we saw at the start, or at the, the, the end of the penultimate lap, onto the start of the last lap, but then uh, just uh, losing a little bit of pace again towards the end. So maybe there was something in the car that was affecting the pace. But uh, Martin Koch and Ryan Hockhoff at least bank two second places, so the points are good for the day's work. That's the positive to take away from all of that. So the podium is being made ready. The uh, drivers, once they're clear of Park Ferme, will head in that direction. And you can see the Lamborghini safety cars and lead cars in the background done for today. But tomorrow we have the uh, GT3 qualifying in the morning, GT4 race before Fanatec GT World Challenge Europe powered by AWS Endurance Cup kicks off its season at 3 o'clock. Three hour race rather than six for the GT3 field tomorrow going back to the original distance of a poor Ricard race. And the teams you'll just see in the background, GT3 cars on the pit lane, they now have their pit stop practice time. Let's look at the highlights then of race two. Great start for Carlo Tamburini, but it wasn't long before Reinhard Koffler was looking to make a move. The cars threaded their way out of turn two safely. But then there was drama as Gilles Vanillet got sideways and almost took uh, Bonjamin Ricci with him. Koffler hit the front, and there were more battles further down the order as well. Simon Birch lost out to Loris Hesmans, but then took the place back under braking, coming down towards turn one. Pit stop cycle through, longer stops for some this time, based on their results in race one on the longer time to be served in the pit lane. Uh, the number one Maserati had dropped a long way down, and Leonardo Guarini found himself with a huge amount of work to do, but work he did. First target, Eric de Donker. Then he got past his teammate, Philippe Pret, having also got past Thomas Anderson in a straight line up towards the chicane on the Mistral. And once that was all done, there were these two pesky KTMs to try to catch further up the road. And catch them, he did. All of a sudden, it was looking as though Gorini had a chance for a win, especially when Martin Koch slowed, coming towards the end of the penultimate lap. But there was contact. There was damage to the Maserati. It briefly stalled, it fired up again and over the line charged Gorini. Then he had a spin and put himself out of the race and Jan Kravec dived through ahead of Martin Koch, who didn't take kindly to that and lent on Kravec coming into the last corner. But Kravec stood his ground and came through for an outright win. Seven hundreds between the two KTMs, Matto Homola and Jan Kravec victorious in race two here at Le Castellet. So to the podium they go. Happy drivers are plenty. So this is the car of the hour, isn't it? The KTM that, perhaps against expectation, came through to take the win. And Jan Kravec and Matha Schomala has come out of international touring car events, prevail as the race winners. And a win a piece for Maserati and KTM at the end of the day here at Paul Ricard.
So there the drivers prepare themselves. Thumbs up from the championship manager, Carolina Zima. And so now with Stefan Rattel already in his uniform rather than his race suit, able to congratulate the drivers. Jean-Luc Bobelic arrives in the picture as well. He's back to us. So we can call forward the drivers then. And uh, Pro-Am will be first, where Thomas Anderson and Simon Birch, the younger of the two, uh, sets forward. Both quick drivers. Simon Birch has proved to be really feisty this weekend as they make the sprint to the third step on the podium. There for second place, Reinhard Koffler and Martin Koch. Oh, so near to a race win, and yet oh, so far as well. They say congrats to their KTM stable mates and go to the podium. And then uh, for the RTR Project team, the team rep steps forward, ready for the drivers to come forward, who are Mato Homola and Jan Krabic, winners here at Aporica in race two. As the light fades, the floodlights come on and the podium takes on a whole different feel. But bravo, that was a really good drive. By the Czech National Anthem and now Matteo Braga, Pirelli Racing Activities Manager, steps forward with the third place trophies for Thomas Anderson and Simon Birch. Then the second place, Reinhard Koffler and Martin Koch. And then the broadest of smiles for the RTR Project team. The team trophy goes in hand and then the winner's trophies to the other end of the podium. And there you have Jan Kravec and Matteo Romola, winners of race two in Fanatec GT World Challenge uh, Europe Power by AWS Endurance Cups weekend at Paul Ricard for Fanatec GT2 European Series. And now trophies almost knocked asunder because it's time to get busy with the champagne. They had to save themselves after race one because of another race to come. Now, however, they don't need the overalls for a few weeks. It doesn't matter if they get wet. Jan Kravec struggling with the champagne. Give it up, Jan. You're too wet now to even bother. And still the bottle hasn't opened, but an RTR project win. Jan Kravec soaked. Vato Homola happy. Clink of the bottles. Uh, there'll be an AM podium yet for the drivers, but uh, a very happy Pro-AM contingent on the Paul Ricard podium here. So drivers jump down off the podium and make their way back to the team. Martin Koch, you can see the frustration, the disappointment. He knows that that was a, a win that went begging. So that Jan Kravac and uh, Matha Homola celebrate their win. And let's see whether that's the first of many over the course of the uh, the Pro-Am winners all together for photographs. The Am podium, though, is about to get underway as third place will go the way uh, of the Alexandre Leroy. Maserati, there is Alexandre making his way to the podium. He was second in the early race, this time it's the other end of the podium. 
for the second step this time. Jean Luc Bobelik and Gilles Vanelet, who were the winners, of course, of race one. <laughs> Still Gilles Vanelet grinning from ear to ear. Great character, as is Jean Luc Bobelik. And two seasoned Am GT racers. Jean Luc Bobelik already wants to get the champagne open uh, before. Onto the podium will come Philippe Pret as the class winner and the LP racing team represented there as well. Bravo, Philippe Pret. Up he steps. Ferrari Challenge, class champion of years past. And uh, please, well done to everybody else that is there. LP racing taking honours then in AM. And Philippe Pret, the class winner. So bravo to our AM chat, uh, race winners and uh, their trophy for third place, Alexandre Laura from Jean-Francois Trulis from Total Energy, uh, to Jean-Luc Bobelic, to Gilles Vanelet, the trophy for second. And there the winners. Team trophy goes to LP Racing and then it will be a trophy for soloist Philippe Pret. Pretty physical day in a sense, with uh, two 50-minute races on your own, but hasn't phased Philippe one jot. And uh, there you can celebrate now honours in the... And Klaus Gilles Vanelet and Jean-Luc Boblet get the Iron Cup as well as the best-placed driver pairing with a combined age of over 100. So even more to celebrate for them here uh, at Fort Ricard. So the final photographs taken, and then they will make their way off the podium. But first, there is all of this champagne to spray as the celebrations conclude Fanatec GT2 European Series action here at Paul Ricard. And we look for a really good season based on what we've had today. Great result for Jan Kravitch and Matho Homola, and we'll see you next time out. From Paul Ricard, from David Addison and the team here, goodbye.